Hi everyone, today we're gonna to be talking about acquiring evidence on a host or an endpoint. So we're gonna be talking about the preparation, the order of volatility, evidence acquisition, acquiring volatile memory and acquiring non-volatile memory. So very often host systems are the targets of malicious actions. They represent a possible initial target so that someone can gain a foothold in the network or a pivot point for additional attacks. Modern operating systems such as Windows, uh, Microsoft Windows create a variety of evidentiary artifacts during the execution of an application, when changes to files are made, or when user accounts are added. All of these changes leave traces of activity. Remember trace evidence principle, what we talked about before, um, that can be evaluated by incident response analysis. The amount of data that's available for analysis and um, for examiners is increasing as storage and memory and even the lowest cost consumer systems continue to increase. So responders and examiners would be uh, prepared to acquire different types of evidence from systems for further analysis. So in uh, preparation, um, analysis or analysts and examiners should have the necessary tools at their disposal to acquire host-based evidence. Um, it's critical that the tools that are selected for the acquisition of evidence are those that are provided by reputable sources and have been proven effectively uh, by other CSERT personnel and have been validated for efficiency prior to use. When supporting an enterprise environment, it's important to have a solid understanding of the types of systems that are commonly deployed. Um, you could find yourself supporting a computer that has a 20 to 80 ratio of Windows to Linux systems and digital forensic examiners and incident response analysts should be prepared with tools and techniques to support the acquisition of the evidence on either operating system. Most tools require administrative privileges Therefore, examiners and IR analysts should be provided with the necessary credentials to perform these types of tasks. Never add new accounts to a possibly compromised system as it may make evidence inadmissible in court or proceeding. Use an existing account. Not all evidence on a system is the same. Uh, volatility is used to describe how data on a host system is maintained after changes, such as log offs or power shutdowns. Data that will be lost if the system is powered down is referred to as volatile data. Volatile data can be data in the CPU, the writing table, or the R cache. One of the most critical pieces of volatile evidence is the memory currently running in the system. When investigating incidents, such as malware, infections, um, the memory in a live system is super critical. Uh, malware leaves a number of key pieces of evidence uh, within the memory of a system. And if lost, it can leave the analyst or the examiner with little to no room uh, to investigate. And this can include artifacts such as the registry data, common history or command history, and network connections. Non-volatile data is the data that is stored on a hard drive and will easily or usually persist after shutdown. Non-volatile data includes the um, MFT, the master file table entries, registry information, and the actual files on the hard drive. While malware creates evidence in memory, there are still some items of evidentiary value there. So evidence acquisition. There are several methods that are used not only to, to not only access a potential evidence source, but determine the type of acquisition that can be undertaken. To define these messages, it's important to have a clear understanding of the matter and type of acquisition that can be utilized on these systems. So there are a number of parallel between digital forensics and other forensic uh, disciplines, such as trace evidence. Um, the key parallel is that organizations acquire evidence need to uh, acquiring evidence need to have a procedure that is sound, rep reproducible, and well documented. Um, so we'll talk about some of the guidelines for proper collection of digital evidence. 
Um, when you get, go to a scene or a general scene, uh, photograph the system and the scene around it. Uh, one of the key pieces of equipment that can save time is a small digital camera. Uh, while it may seem like overkill to photograph a system in place in the event that action uh, that has been taken by an incident responder sees the inside of a courtroom, having photos that will allow for proper reconstruction of the events is quite useful. Um, though, um, make sure that you utilize a separate camera. Utilizing a cell phone may expose the device to discovery in the event of a lawsuit of criminal proceedings. So the best method is to take all the photos that are necessary and, and at a convenient time and place and transfer them to a permanent storage. Uh, determine whether the system is powered up. So if the system is powered on, leave it on. If the system is powered off, don't power it on. And leave it off. A number of changes can take place when turning a system on or off. In the event that the system is powered on, the volatile memory will be able to be captured. In addition, uh, in the case of full disk encryption, leave the system on. Leaving the system on will allow the responder or examiner to still acquire the local disk volumes. If the system is turned off, uh, preserving this, this state uh, ensures that. Um, any evidence in the non-volatile memory is preserved. If the examiner feels that the system may be in danger to other systems, simply just unplug the system from the network to isolate it. Um, you can acquire uh, running memory. This is a critical step and the evidence can, re uh, can produce a wealth of data concerning running processes, DLLs in use, um, network connections. And due to this procedures for acquiring memory um, will be covered later, plus I'll give a little demo. Um, you can acquire the registry and log files. While these files are non-volatile in nature, having near immediate access is beneficial, especially when investigating malware or other exploitation means. Unplug the power from the back of the system. In the event that the power, the system is a laptop, remove the battery as well. This preserves the state of the system. Uh, and bring it with you. You don't wanna get to a lab and not have the battery or the charging cable, uh, it's, it's bad juju. Uh, photograph the back or bottom of the system to capture the model and serial number. This allows the analyst and the examiner to capture any information necessary for the chain of custody. Uh, remove the cover from the system, photograph the hard drive to capture the model and serial number, again, for the use of the chain of custody. Uh, then remove the hard drive from the system and package it in an anti-static bag. Uh, secure the drive in a sealable envelope or box. Anti-static bags will protect the drive and packaging will ensure that any attempts to open it will be evident. This can be facilitated through purpose design evidence bags and uh, simple mailing envelopes that can be sealed uh, with tape. Um, the bag and envelope should also be labeled. Um, and then additional is uh, documenting all actions. So ensure that dates and times are recorded um, as well, uh, which analysts or examiners perform these actions. Uh, incident reporting is often the last stage of any response. So as a result, hour or even days can pass before an analyst are even able to record their actions. So taking pictures and notes during the initial seizure um, are invaluable when it comes to reconstructing this, uh, this sequence of events. Understanding the forensic examination environment. Uh, this concept does not only apply to physical locations, but anywhere we complete a digital forensic examination and perform actions to support the digital forensic investigation. So forensically sound examination environment is a mindset of the digital forensic examiner. Uh, we want to be methodical and thorough as uh, we perform any action to support the digital forensic examination. So no actions will occur unless the digital forensic examiner intends the action to occur. Your ability to mitigate the opposing counsel's attempt to inject doubt into your position is directly related to your preparation and the documentation you create during the examination process. Being aware and following the best practices is critical in your ability to defend your actions and findings. You don't need to know the specific code to uh, the tools used, but you do need to know where the artifacts are found by the tool 
um, and um, uh, located within the, the file system, the Aubrey system. So you can um, explain uh, in while you within your your um, when you testify or create your report. Um, there are numerous checklists that can be uh, used to help with the process. However, the analyst and examiner are expected to understand the process in recovering the artifacts on the checklist. Um, or, or their expert witness testimony uh, will be rather uncomfortable. So if you don't know how to use a tool, um, learn to understand what it's actually doing when it's uh, acquiring and um, parsing out the data that, that you're presenting. So when selecting a tool, you need to determine uh, if your tool produces valid results. Um, and if the forensic tool is found faulty, then the user of the tool may be used as a means to discredit the integrity um, of the exam and the competence of the examiner. It's not very fun if that ever happens. So what is evidence? Um, the available body of facts of information indicating whether a belief or proposition is true or valid. Uh, so it sounds pretty simple, but it, it comes more convoluted when you take that into account. So when you take into regulations, law, and rules of evidence in on jurisdiction, which becomes even more convoluted with dealing with multiple jurisdictions, we have something called a uh, tier of facts. So the person, such as a judge or a group of persons, such as a jury, uh, tasked with making uh, factual findings based on the evidence in a trial or other court proceedings. Uh, despite the tier of facts, uh, of fact, you, if you accept the evidence, it can still be called into question. Um, so don't forego proper evidence handling procedures, evidence handling um, transportation, chain of custody, and do not forego utilizing proper procedures methodologies and processing when conducting your digital forensic investigation. So no shortcuts. Um, validate any procedure um, and process. Do not rely on third parties to do the validation. Validation must be reproducible and be concluded with the same results. Uh, local acquisition. So uh, having access to the system under the investigation is often super luxurious for most enterprises, um, especially now today that we're working, most people are working from home. A lot of the computers are no longer on site. They are at home, so they are remote. Uh, there are many times where incident response and analysts, examiners have um, direct physical access to the systems, but um, these days uh, endpoints such as workstations um, are no longer that accessible. However, uh, you still are able to access it remotely um, or on site. You'll have your uh, your endpoints such as your um, your your firewalls, your uh, switches, um, and your appliances that are still available on site. So to perform a local acquisition, analysts and examiners require um, an external hard drive or USB with sufficient space uh, for the capture of at um, at least the running memory of the system or systems that are being investigated, along with other files that are deemed necessary. Um, in order to ensure the integrity of the evidence being collected, it's uh, I advise to configure a USB drive with two partitions. The first partition should contain the necessary tools to perform the evidence um, acquisition, and then the second partition should act as a repository for that evidence. Um, so keeping it completely separate is um, ideal. And this also allows for the analyst examiner to move evidence to a more permanent form of storage and, and subsequently wipe the evidence partition without having to reinstall the tools on the USB drive. Remote acquisition. So this uh, leveraging tools and network connections to acquire evidence. Uh, it's an obvious choice that the examiner is dealing with geographical challenges. This can be useful if personnel cannot be on site immediately. So a lot of the tools, um, especially um, paid tools such as I believe Axiom and it does really a really good job as well as Encase. Um, they both have remote acquisition uh, possibilities. Um, all you need to do is enter in the um, well, let's say 
uh, let's say you want to acquire an enterprise workstation, but they're, work they're working from home, um, have the user connect to the VPN, so it's within the network, and then you can utilize uh, use the IP address that they're being connected to to, to connect to that, um, or you can uh, attempt to connect with the, um, not the visible, or the local IP address that it's, that it's using. Uh, live acquisition. So this occurs when the examiner requires the evidence from a system that is currently powered on and running. Um, completely acquiring digital evidence from a live system may be a technique that is necessary for high availability environments where systems can't be taken offline. So if the system um, does go offline, um, you can do a, uh, a just a local acquisition, but if it requires to stay online, um, such as a web server or a file share server or anything that just cannot go down at any point uh, because of operational reasons, a live acquisition is probably an, an easiest one. Also, live acquisitions tend to be a little bit smaller and a little bit faster to complete. Um, incident response um, analysts love having loves doing live acquisitions because it'll actually help you triage faster rather than doing a full image and going through the full image. Live acquisitions are a little bit faster. Um, here you'll have evidence sources. So these are the type of sources that you can, um, I think this is a snapshot from Axiom actually. You have a drive um, that you can acquire from, or evidence sources is a drive, an image that has already been completed, files and folders that have been extracted either by USB or um, uh, other sense, volume shadow copies, and then you have your memory. Hypervisors and virtual machines. Uh, when performing acquisitions on a hypervisor or a virtual machine, uh, analysts and examiners, you, you need to understand the difference between type one and type two hypervisors. So a hypervisor originally called um, virtual machine monitor or VMM, uh, abstracts uh, operating systems and application from the underlying hardware. Uh, virtualization requires a hypervisor. The hypervisor enables the host hardware to operate multiple virtual machines independent of each other and share hardware resources. So type one used on an enterprise level, also known as bare metal hosting, this type of hypervisor does not have um, to um, load on any underlying operating system. Examples would be a VMware vSphere, so ESXi and, and vCenter for management. Uh, Microsoft's Hyper-V or MS Windows Server 2012 Hyper-V, uh, KVM, which is a Linux distro, it's open source, Zen or Z uh, Citrix Zen server, and then you have the Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization, um, RHEV. Type 2, a use for smaller admins and local users, also known as a hosted hypervisor. This type relies on the hosted operating system to manage calls to the CPU, memory, storage, and network resources. Examples of that would be Oracle VirtualBox, uh, VM Workstation Pro, or VMware Fusion. And then you have QEMU, which is an open source option as well. Um, there are certain files an examiner and analyst will require in order to complete a full ana um, analysis of virtual machines. Um, then you can perform offline acquisitions, uh, most often used by law enforcement agencies to preserve digital evidence on hard drives. This technique requires that the system be powered down and the hard drive be removed. So depending on the type of incident or um, and uh, constraints on time and location, incident response analysts and digital forensic examiners should be prepared to perform any of these types of acquisitions. Um, the best case scenario is for CSER to have the ability to perform both live and offline acquisition on any suspected system. This provides the greatest amount of evidence that can be analyzed, and the analysis and examiners should have the necessary tools and experience to conduct evidence acquisition through any method um, mentioned. Solid state device, there's a, uh, some special considerations with these guys. Um, so solid state storage is becoming more prevalent in the business and consumer market. Uh, SSDs created an interesting issue regarding digital forensics. Um, you have what's called garbage collection. So when a user deletes a file, formats a partition or deletes a partition, 
the firmware starts to the garbage collection process with the trim command. This causes the unall unallocated space to be wiped and the deleted data no longer accessible. There are automated processes that run through the firmware uh, on the SSD and the examiner has no way of stopping or intercepting it. Um, the where leveling, the where leveling, um, this feature um, ensures that the storage blocks on the SSD are used at a similar rate. So if blocks on the storage device are overused or if the block blocks are not equal, it can lead to premature failure of some storage blocks. The firmware on the SSD will decide where to move the data on the storage device. And so plugging a SSD in can cause the firmware to move that data around. So when creating a forensic image of the SSD, you can collect uh, and it, your pre and post hashes of the device. If you return to the device after a few days or weeks or months or later, you might have different hash values. So while processing the SSD, depending on the idle time of the drive, you might also end up with different hashes in your pre and post image hashings. Um, there's a really cool article or a blog on uh, El uh, Elcomsoft that I can link. Um, and it's called Life After Trim Using Factory Access Mode for Imaging SSD Drives. It's, it's a really cool read and they did a really good job of explaining it, um, highly recommended. Acquiring volatile memory. Um, incident responders and examiners will find a great deal of evidence for a security incident containing within the memory of a potential compromise system. Yeah, so traditional digital forensics, aka dead box forensics, uh, focuses on the hard disk drive uh, that has been taken from a shutdown system acting as the primary source of evidence. To acquire this evidence, the system has to be powered off, thereby destroying any potential evidence that could be found within the volatile memory. Um, however, um, with trace evidence, it's often found that uh, most of this uh, evidence is found within running in memory. So, um, it, but it can also all be acquired fairly quickly and fairly easily using a couple tools. Um, there's Magnet has a RAM capture, and then there's also Mandiant has Redline, uh, and you can also capture it using Volatility version two and three now. Uh, so uh, other several tools are um, um, Belkasoft has a RAM capture as well, as well as Windows PMEM. Um, and then there's uh, Recall, R-E-K-A-L-L, -L, I believe. So there's, there's quite a bit of tools for volatile memory capture. Uh, volatile local and remote acquisition. Uh, local acquisition, when acquiring memory in this fashion, it's advisable to use a external drive with sufficient capacity for multiple files. So create a USB with two partitions, one of them for the tools that are necessary to perform the memory acquisition, and the second partition for the one containing the evidence files. Uh, remote acquisition, ensure that if remote technology is used, that is, this is documented. This will allow proper identification of legitimate versus suspected connections later on. Non-volatile um, remote and local acquisition. There's a great deal of evidence that can be found in the system's hard drive. Prior to shutting down the system, it's ideal to, for the examiner to collect the following, the registry keys and hives and event logs, security application and system because um, once the system starts shutting down, uh, the system will actually start changing some of the logging systems and possibly roll over some logs, depending on what the um, preservation uh, policies are um, or log retention is on those systems. And then last but not least, we have full disk encryption or FTE. So it's a good idea to determine if the disk has any FTE implemented. So BitLocker is now part of a Windows operating system. Um, there are tons of different encryptor softwares out there too. 
Magnet Forensics has a free tool that you can use to determine whether there are any encrypted volumes on the drive. But keep in mind, software like VeraCrypt can hide encrypted containers uh, that only a few tools will actually help you find. Um, if you don't have any of the encryption keys, it's best to acquire the logical volume while the system is still running. Once you turn that, that system off, though, you're going to be facing with the, um, the encrypted volume. You won't be able to retrieve even a logical acquisition of that volume. Um, so that's it for the acquisition um, for host evidence. Um, the next video, I'm going to be talking about the acquisition uh, for mobiles. And I hope to see you there. Thank you.